Welcome to Digital Momentum. My name is Maria Holzinger and I'm happy to be the host of today's episode. My guests, Smack's very own Ralph Meyer and Michael Weixbaumer, had the opportunity to go to New York City and visit the National Retail Federation's annual gathering, modestly titled The Big Show. I'm curious to find out what their biggest learnings are. So hi, Ralph. Hi, Michael. Welcome to our podcast. Happy to have you here. <laughs> hey, yeah, thanks for having us. Thank you. for. So I, I, I just want to jump in because I'm so curious to know everything and just to learn what you learned basically in the Big Apple. Um, so NRF is a very big event in the US, I'd say. So, But what are your biggest takeaways for actually the European retailers? Yeah, definitely. So that's an interesting question because in general, I mean, retail is not that different across the world, right? But one thing that makes the US very specific uh, and very peculiar is just the scale at which some of those retailers are operating. And one interesting takeaway here from the NRF conference was how retailers like uh, Walmart or Best Buy or Target, um, how they coped with the, the disruptions caused by the pandemic and how challenging, but also how interesting it was for them to roll out new models such as click and collect um, across a really large um, scale of, of uh, physical locations. Michael, what are your learnings? Well, on the first hand, I can only agree to what, what Ralph has said. Um, as well as um, being surprised to a certain extent of how much um, diversity and inclusion, all those topics are really uh, discussed on a, a broad scale and are a very important topic for the general public in the US. Um, and what also may, was quite surprising to me, um, the fact that inflation, expected inflation, was a very hot topic among retailers. They were really expecting um, that the foreseeable inflation from their point of view is going to have an effect on their business models. They were for, for certain verticals, for example, embracing uh, the creation of, of private labels um, and, and thinking that private labels in general are becoming more important for them. Um, what also uh, was a kind of interesting takeaway is that um, finally, I'd say AI and data science have fully arrived in the mind of every retailer. So it's on every retailer's, uh, basically on every CEO's plate that this is something they need to think about and, and uh, basically try to incorporate into their company or organization. Mm -hmm. So, but then what are the biggest differences you would say between the US retailers and the, the, the European retailers? Are they further ahead? What are their challenges? And how can European retailers maybe already prepare for those challenges that sooner or later will be arriving at our markets? Um, I can only tie into what, what Michael just said on the AI and data science topic. Um, to give you a practical example, one of the big um, issues that was discussed a lot at the conference was how retailers can cope with this um, ongoing uncertainty when it comes to supply. And um, an interesting idea that, that some of them had was just leveraging their existing um, data-driven capabilities and applying them to um, predict other things rather than just um, demand, for example, but also supply. So to basically take those, those data capabilities that they have and those machine learning models and those um, data science capacities and apply them to um, uh, predict uh, what would happen if uh, supply levels change or supply times just were a lot longer or so. Um, and of course, that's a big um, connection back to the, the AI and data science topic. And that of course is the same in, in the US as in Europe. Um, but as Michael said, we really learned that for US retailers, um, AI and data science definitely is on top of everybody's minds. And I'm not so sure if that's the case with every retailer in Europe, to be true. Michael, did you also gather some big differences here? Well, what I think um, is, is really an opportunity for European retailers, especially is um, being aware of the experience you provide as a retailer and being ready to invest in the experience. Um, after, after having listened to many thought leaders in the retail industry in the US, basically my main conclusion is that um, if, you're a, if you're into retail, in order to stay ahead of the competition, you only have a certain set of levers that you can pull. 
um, and experience is definitely one of them. And uh, one of the big learnings is that um, people are moving away from this thought of this is my digital channel, this is my physical channel. This has been a topic that has been uh, going on for several years, but it's really about how can the experience in the digital channels be improved? How can the experience in the physical channels be improved? And uh, even more important, how can existing barriers between those channels be, be eroded? It's really an opportunity to focus on erasing uh, the barriers between physical and digital channels um, and provide a seamless experience to consumers. I think this is uh, uh, this is something that has taken U.S. retailers a certain time to learn, and uh, in order to uh, take uh, taken time to learn to to understand what what which parts of the physical experience need to become um, from a certain point of view more transactional, which parts of the digital experience need to become um, a bit more exciting and personalized. And if you if you get that mix right, you you are in the position to get ahead of the competition. Mm -hmm. This also goes into play with um, that retail has faced huge disruption because of the pandemic, because of other factors, because of the changing markets. Um, can we already draw some conclusions about the lessons that the U.S. already learned? I think you've mentioned some of the, uh, of those learnings already, uh, Michael. But uh, are there some conclusions for European markets there, and for the or the lessons learned for the U.S. markets? To me, it's like, um, yeah, basically, pandemic, great resignation, which means in the U.S. a lot of people are actually quitting their job. Um, there is a there is a there's a shortage in available workforce, um, the rise of inflation, all those things um, have been thrown at the retail industry, and the retail industry has responded with great agility and um, has overcome those challenges to a certain amount. Um, sometimes quicker, sometimes not so quick, but in the end, it it still uh, remained true to its original mission, which is always to serve its consumers. Um, I think uh, what we definitely can say has been learned by the retail industry in general is that the role of physical stores is um, changing. So uh, a few years ago, there was this assumption that, well, everything is going to be digital, physical is going to be dead sooner or later. Um, that perception has clearly changed. Um, the role of physical is evolving into an idea of uh, basically what is called a hub and spoke model, um, a model, meaning that your physical locations are also part of your logistics and distribution centers and can be utilized for that purpose. Um, and that's thing, I think one of the one of the main conclusions that I would draw. Mm -hmm. Um, so the traditional brick and mortar retail has often been proclaimed dead. Uh, I think there was a very interesting debate going on, as, as lead, uh, you told me here, Ralph, uh, that uh, Brian Cornell, the CEO of Target, actually said brick and mortar is dead. The brick and mortar retail is dead. Do you want to uh, maybe elaborate on that? Yeah, that was an interesting story, actually. In, in, in his keynote, he mentioned that um, actually a couple of years ago, so before the start of the pandemic, um, he faced huge, um, a huge pressure from his board of directors to essentially cut down on brick and mortar retail um, because of what Michael just mentioned, namely that people thought um, the future would be purely digital and purely e-commerce based. Um, but then, especially throughout the pandemic, they learned that those physical locations um, in, in so many places as, uh, as Target has them um, can be leveraged as, as huge assets also, for example, as fulfillment centers for um, e-commerce. So this combination and this blending of leveraging assets that you already have uh, in, in a sense of physical locations and leveraging them for new models that are partly digital and partly, partly physical, um, that was definitely a big learning for them, for Target. And um, I think also something the European retailers can relate to. So I'm thinking about a couple of uh, clients that I'm working with who mentioned the exact same thing, namely that this overlap between being able to also shift workforce quickly. So having somebody working in a physical store serving customers, but in, in sort of the, the, the low tide times in the store, 
um, preparing pa packages to be sent out for, for e-commerce fulfillment. Um, that was a big um, asset for, for some of them who have access to both physical and, and the digital experience. So definitely a, a good learning and something that can be replicated in Europe as well, I think. Very interesting, very interesting. So, um, Michael, one question for you uh, as our expert here. Data and analytics is getting more and more important in general, but um, in general, I'd say in retail optimization. So what novel ideas did you hear about uh, that in the conference? Well, there, there have been a lot of ideas. Um, what was really a novelty to me was that um, even big U.S. retailers become more and more aware of regulations like the GDPR in, in Europe and think that those, they, they consider them as ex, external factors that make it essential for them to get their privacy and ethics when it comes to data acquisition right now. And uh, what was uh, really interesting is that this broad consensus among retailers that it, now is the time to really do, first of all, do that and, and then really get started with acquiring and leveraging consumer data and that this acquiring and leveraging consumer data is the next key differentiator for them. Um, yeah, what was also really interesting, um, the experience that was shared by the, the CEO of Best Buy, Corey Berry, uh, when she said that they have, they have learned that when their customers, once they experience and once they learn that they as Best Buy know what is important to them right now in a certain situation, when they, ex a, a, for example, approach after sales uh, services, that customers actually appreciate um, this kind of experience that includes, okay, my retailer knows a lot of stuff about me and knows that I'm approaching him because of a certain problem that I have or because of, I'm interested in a certain topic and that this experience really reflect into increased customer or cu consumer loyalty from the retailer's perspective. So those retailers have basically learned that investing in data and analytics really helps to improve bottom line numbers. And that was really one, basically one big change in momentum from, from my point of view. And uh, what I also think is um, that these huge organizations, um, because of the um, because of the challenges they have been facing during the pandemic, really have have become um, more fond of the idea of moving fast and exploring and, and learning. And as the president of the NRF stated, Matthew Shea, he, he really did a quote that I would like to repeat. Um, he said, "If you don't like change and flexibility, you will like irrelevance even less." <laughs> very true <laughs> so that's one thing uh, we can prepare for to not be irrelevant in the future definitely so um, one thing that leads me already to the next topic I'd say is uh, then trends uh, uh, beyond what's relevant today obviously there is there are those big future future trends or as others might call them mega trends uh, what kind of trends were really hyped at the NRF Ralph maybe you want to uh, start here Sure, yeah, that was also one of the, the key things why I was so interested in the conference in the first place, um, because we wanted to learn what the big trends and the, the big sort of uh, future consumer behaviors are that the people are expecting and that retailers should prepare for right now. Um, but first of all, I want to unders underscore again what Michael just said on the innovation piece, because that's so valuable. Um, retailers... Um, in the past were not perceived as the most innovative industry, I would say, especially those industry giants um, like, as we said, a Walmart or a Best Buy, who were considered rather um, behemoths in their, in their corporate behavior. But the fact that they were forced to innovate so quickly throughout the pandemic, offering new models, new fulfillment models, new distribution models, um, that really taught them how to innovate on a, on a weekly or even daily cycle and try out new things in the market really, really fast. Um, and that's definitely here to stay. That's not going to go away. And that is a capability that they can then leverage also to address all of the other trends that might be coming up. Um, some of those trends that were discussed there at the, at the NRF conference were, 
for us Europeans, a little bit more on the futuristic side, I would say. So there were surprisingly many talks about the, the metaverse and what retailers can expect from um, everybody living in the metaverse two years from now. Uh, and there was a quite wide variety of, of takes on that, which I found really interesting. So you've got people there who are saying, well, the metaverse is already here. Um, big brands like Adidas, like Nike, like Gucci, they already have um, virtual storefronts in, in um, one or the other um, version or implementation of the metaverse. Um, for others, it's really a totally futuristic topic and they, they connect it with things like um, uh, NFT commerce, direct to avatar commerce and, and all those more, um, you know, slightly, slightly less tangible um, areas of, of business. Um, but there is a, a definitely good connection there and a, def and, and a path there for every retailer to, to leverage these types of things. So one thing that came up repeatedly was, well, if you're um, a traditional retailer, you're selling physical goods, um, you want to build up your brand reputation, now is definitely the time to start up at least a small test balloon of advertising in uh, one or the other metaverse implementation because that is a channel to reach um, a very different um, audience than you would on your traditional um, advertising channels. Um, I really love the statement by, by one of the market researchers there who talked about the metaverse, that, uh, who said that um, in a couple of years from now, I think in 2030 already, um, the combined spending power of millennials and generation Zs, so people roughly born after 1995, um, is expected already to exceed the spending power of baby, uh, baby boomers and uh, uh, and uh, millennials, uh, yeah, baby boomers and millennials combined. Sorry. So um, the the point there is that really there's a lot of um, potential there in this very young generation of consumers. And as a retailer, you should be you should trying to meet those um, this, that new generation of consumers um, where they are and and where they want to be met. And that's essentially on their phones in in the social apps that they're using. Um, and why not also in the metaverse? Yeah. So should then, what's, what, what is the conclusion there for the European uh, retailers? Should we already get our storefront basically in the metaverse? Or how should we kind of prepare for all those mega trends? What would, would be your draws, drawbacks here or your, your conclusions? <laughs> yeah, that's an interesting question, of course. And a question that I think is on, on top of uh, everybody's minds now in, in the retail industry, right? I think there's two answers to that. So on the on the more strategic level, um, having a, uh, the capability to innovate fast and to try out those new things fast is hugely important and is getting even more important um, because you don't know which of the different metaverse implementations will stick, for example. So you just have to place bets on some of them and see um, which actually takes off on uh, if the whole thing actually takes off for you. Um, but on the other side, I think it's also interesting to take a look um, not so much at the uh, US retailers, but to take a look also at uh, Asian retailers, for example, and to see what people in, in Japan and South Korea are up to. Um, one thing that I haven't uh, known before the conference was that, so that uh, Seoul is going to be the first city moving to the metaverse. And it's going to be a virtual replication of, of Seoul in the metaverse, um, including a lot of uh, stores, obviously. And um, this is something that, that we have not seen in the US and we have also not seen in Europe happening so far. So yeah, looking at US retailers when it comes to innovation, definitely helpful. But if you want to really be um, at the, the bleeding edge of innovation, um, why not also take a closer look at what the guys in, in Europe, uh, in, in Asia have to, sorry. <laughs> Michael, what's your take on that? Well, when, when we're talking about trends, I would like to add on what, what Ralph said regarding metaverse and NFTs. Uh, one perspective that I really, really liked was the idea of I think of the metaverse as an additional engagement channel, especially for the generation of consumers that is about to, um, you know, basically move into a commercially relevant existence. Let's try to put it this way. So um, a possibility of getting uh, a first hands-on experience with, with brands that, are, that have a certain price point. I think one of the examples that uh, somebody mentioned was that what used to be um, the exp the expensive fashion brands lipstick somebody would get as the first item of that brand now could be um, this branded item in the metaverse was this branded digital item also the fact that for example over 60 percent of the under 14 year olds in the us 
uh, had a, some kind of in-game metaverse currency on their wish list was really something um, that shows the yeah upcoming commercial relevance of of those channels and um, what is uh, I think a, a little uh, less um, uh, or a little bit more immediate when it, when we think about it from a time perspective is really this idea of um, besides getting your experience right is is moving towards personalization uh, of individual consumer experience and um, the clear idea or the, the clear concept that basically retailers had and which by the way we also have is that in order to be able to provide a personalized experience you need um, a centralized data platform in order to get a consolidated view on, on clients uh, and what they expect um, so um, this is also the direction that we are moving into um, helping retailers uh, make this kind of personalization uh, become a reality. Thank you so much, guys, uh, for uh, summarizing uh, your experience there. And one way of summar summarizing that I want to conclude then this episode of the podcast with is obviously because we want to stay current here. What would your hashtag be for your experience? Uh, we've learned this. Uh, the hashtag for your overall experience, Ralph, uh, for the NRF uh, <laughs> experience for you. I'm going to stay rather conservative and pick the, the conference uh, motto as a hashtag, which was hashtag accelerate. Wonderful. Michael, what about you? What's your hashtag? I guess my hashtag is either going to be big show because it was a big show or it's going to be data driven. Thank you, everybody, for listening. And if you enjoyed this podcast, feel free to share, like and subscribe. This podcast is produced by Smarter Ecommerce. And to learn more on topics like these and more, visit our website, smarter-ecommerce.com. Thank you, guys.